Welcome to the Property Nomad podcast today. Delighted to be joined by Matt Baker. Uh, Matt is the co-founder of Scott Baker Properties, the HMO platform, and the head of business development at CoHome, and the number one best-selling author of Next Level Landlord. Matt is a specialist in Next Level HMO and co-living developments. He is recognised in the property industry as one of the country's leading HMO and co-living educators. A start in life as a musician, Matt has always had a creative sight, composing and performing as a pianist in numerous collaborations. He grew, also grew and sold a successful musical education business. And within the first four years of property investing, uh, Matt has accrued a portfolio of uh, over £5 million, pounds, uh, predominantly using investor finance. Matt, thank you very much for your time. Um, yeah, thank you for having me, uh, Rob. It's great to be here. Uh, I think you pretty much covered everything there. So uh, should we wrap it up now? <laughs> Quickest <laughs> podcast episode ever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, so much to cover today. I think the you know for the listeners, we're really really going to deep dive into co living and, and HMOs, and yep. you know obviously you've got a, a wealth of information to to pass over. But what got you into property sphere in the first place oh that's a very good question because um uh, as you mentioned there in the intro i started that life as a musician so all through my 20s i was a professional pianist a session musician and realized very quickly that uh the income of a creative in the, well, in the creative arts in general is very up and down pretty much like a roller coaster and i've always been looking for more of a resilient income something which i can um get if somebody's just going to continue to, to, to pay me without me having to go and, and, and spend lots of time and effort and doing it. So they put the effort in once and then reap the rewards. And I was trying to do that in the music by creating music, putting it out there, working with bands and all of that. Um, but then I realized that the income was going to continue to be choppy. Um, so then I started teaching, which was very um, solid income and consistent, but it was very much exchanging my time for money and um, as a piano teacher. And then when I started to get too busy, I took on some other teachers, set up a music school, and then I started to realize how I could leverage other people's time to create to create income. So the music school was uh, was great, um, and I sold that a few years ago, and that was in South Oxfordshire. And um, it was when I was trying to grow the music school that I came across property investing through a seminar. I went to a seminar about business growth, uh, and there was a lady speaking about property investing, and I thought, well, that sounds quite interesting. Went on a you know, the, the typical three-day course, um, signed up and did some mentorships and, it, and uh, one thing led to another. And I became quite successful, got busy. Um, and so th that was the, the initial foray into property investing. And then I've done quite a lot since then. Just going back to, just going back to setting up the music school then. So yep. you realise that you can leverage other people's time, obviously fantastic. Was there no... I guess was there no other light bulb moment as in you, you didn't have business mentoring at the time and the mentor said go and do xyz was it just something that naturally happened and you thought this is my light bulb moment yeah I never really started having uh, mentors in the business space um, until I got into property mm -hmm. um, a lot of the kind of that business growth and understanding has been from uh, you know having having property at the at kind of being one of those incomes so I built other businesses around that now which we'll actually we'll come to in a moment but um understanding the business world was kind of by accident through just going okay i'm too busy i can't teach all these people i am having all these inquiries coming in why am i why am i wasting that you know that goodwill that i have in in that marketplace so then i um a friend of mine had this um other friend who was looking for work as a piano teacher um, she was changing career but had been a piano teacher in the past and and so and here's a ready-made list of people just turn up and teach and um, I'll sort out all, all the the hassle of the admin dealing with the parents and all that stuff um, so it was yeah that was the realization um, I knew I wanted to be in business I was always trying to find something to do I've, I've been quite other a few other failed attempts of doing businesses um, but the music school was the most successful one um, to start with and then obviously moving into property Awesome stuff. I'm trying to not come up with music pun after music pun, uh, to be honest. I've got a couple in my head. But <laughs> all of that being said, fast forward into, into property. So as you say, your usual sort of three-day seminar, get some mentorship, which is, of course, a, an incredibly 
common but yet useful route to go down if you take the mm -hmm. necessary action, which you have done. Did you go straight into HMOs and co-living or was there something else you've done on the side before? It's a very good question. I started as I was taught, do something simple first. So, but I knew I wanted to get into HMOs quite quickly. So um, when I was out looking for my first property, um, I actually came across two properties. I, I was I put the word out there with the agents that I was looking for HMO style property. Um, but I also wanted you know, buy to let anything with need a bit of love, brown swirly carpets, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, they brought me probably about three or four properties. And I went viewing on one Saturday with my mom and my dad, who I was buying these, these two properties with back in 2015. And um, we went in and we said, like, love this one love the next one and my, me and my mum would get really excited go oh yeah we do this so we put in a cheeky offer on on the, the bungalow which was the buy to let and um, that got um accepted pretty much straight away and we just thought oh my goodness this property thing actually works you know I, that, it was on the market for like 120 we got it for like 105 and we're just like does that happen we just happened brilliant and that's worth one 170 now so we're very very happy with that one um then the second one was a perfect five bed hmo conversion again uh, in an absolute state of a property and um yeah we we saw it and me and my mum again said oh this one's going to work i think we got it for 100 just over 100 and um uh, my dad was umming and ahhing about the numbers he's a bit of a detail person so um and um, so i was kind of waiting for him to go yes i'm happy yes i'm happy I couldn't be bothered. I put the rang up, put the offer in, got the offer accepted. By the Monday or the Tuesday, my dad turned around and said, yes, I think this is really good. I said, well, it's a good job because if the offer was accepted on uh, <laughs> yesterday. So, um, yeah, we didn't want to be caught by analysis paralysis. But um, so we actually bought two properties in one day. Well, offer accepted. The bungalow actually completed really quickly. And we had that one um, ready to, we bought it in December, had it ready to rent in the February. And then we had a tenant in there. And then the um, HMO, this was back in 2016. Um, there was issues with the with, with the title and, and the vendor was being slow. And the, the government just brought in the 3% extra stamp duty. It was coming live on the 1st of April. Um, so, was, so we were just saying this has got to go through by the 31st of March, 31st of March. Um, and actually found it with my solicitor. The first time I'd used them that was actually dragging their heels. Um, just demanding the same bit of information which the other side didn't have and it was only when I rang them up and said so what is the problem here and she said oh we need this information about the title and, and the other side say they don't have it I keep asking for it but they can't, they're not providing it so I said what's the solution she said oh we can get an insurance policy I said, how much like 30 quid I was like, well let's do that why didn't we do that two months ago and they were completed on the 31st of March so um so yeah so we had that first bungalow learned a lot on that convert uh, that renovation and then we did our first hmo conversion pretty much about three months later so that was the, the first two properties that we did at one point i just uh add there that i loved how you sort of frame that with the solicitor you know it's very easy in, in that sort of situation to you know what i say the chimp paradox sort of comes in you know start yelling and shouting etc but you've, you've gone there and basically said you know what's the solution which i think if people if you're going to heed something from this episode you know that's one way one thing to certainly heed is you know you then put in the shoe on their foot and say you know okay well this is what the issue is what's the solution oh we can do x y and z sometimes they might say oh we don't have x y and z but in that situation you know, you're, you're yeah. still always giving them control of the situation still. And then they, yeah, uh, that, I'm kind of waffling, but you, you kind of get the gist of what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that a lot of solicitors don't think outside the box. You get some that, that do and are really good at finding creative solutions to problems, but some just, um, because conveyancing is such a conveyor belt, of um is those two words must be linked in some way shape or form it's a conveyor belt of stuff they're not really thinking about your case they're going they're doing five minutes on yours ten minutes on yours and then moving on to the next one so when yeah when you're waiting a long time to hear you assume that things are being done on the background was actually they probably just sent a letter that they've been waiting three weeks for a response mm -hmm. and they've not done anything about it so um uh yeah it, it is that more creative solicitor that we that we like working with um, or as you say, just speaking to them and, and um, asking for solutions. You know, what is the hold up? How can I help you to? How can we help you to move this along? Yeah, and remaining calm under you know that pressure 
so whilst on whilst on the phone yes well when the phone goes down it's a completely different story but whilst on the phone <laughs> definitely so they're the first so they're the first two properties and again just for the benefit of people listening uh, you said you were doing them with your uh, parents uh, was that a case of they were supplying the investor slash angel finance at the time for those yes they were my first investors um we did three or four projects yeah four projects together um before that um well they ran out of money for about through this um into the third one so then we started using investor finance um through family then extended um family and friends um then um yes yeah, so, so that was how we started and then we evolved from there proves in the pudding that sometimes the best place or you know, the best place to start asking or mentioning ideas is within the family because same same here uh Mother was the first uh, angel investor, and you know, with yourself, parents being uh, angel investors as well. So you never know what's in the family to ask. No, and uh, don't be afraid of what that what they might say, um, because they could only say no. And it was actually a conversation where I said, "Well, I'm going to go and do this anyway." I, I didn't, I, I didn't kind of say, "Well, with or without you," but it was kind of like, "Well, this is going to happen one way or another." Um, they were interested in property anyway, um, so I'm said, "Well, I'm, I'm going to go do it." Um, you can be involved or you can watch. Um, so they got involved. <laughs> happy, happy day. That's, that's perfect. I love hearing stories like that. It's, it's good. Yeah. So again, fast forward a couple of steps. So a few projects done with, with your parents, yep. obviously raise another um, investor finance projects as well. I'm sure people are going to be listening to this saying, Rob, you just start talking about HMOs. So what then made you go down the, the HMO slash co-living route so hmo was the buzzword when we did that when i did that training back in 2015 it was a buzzword of okay so that's what you want for high cash flow so i was like okay i want to do hmos i want high cash flow i want to get more out of a property um than just you know a, a family home because we can really make that those bricks and mortars work work hard so that's what we wanted to do but i knew i didn't want to make really poor quality rooms i knew i wanted quality to be at the heart of what we do and actually put the tenant at the heart of what we do and that's why uh, we now have a methodology called the tenant first method which is part of my book which you mentioned at the beginning next level landlord um, and that ethos i've carried from the very beginning but i've really learned how to do it as we've gone on because we haven't got it right all the time like we have made some rooms which are maybe a little bit too small and on suite which actually wasn't very workable you know then we have these odd oddities in the portfolio which Sometimes you choose, other times your builder pushes you into and you go, oh, okay, then. Um, so we can, if we do this, we do that. But as you find more creative solutions and you understand what the tenants are looking for, you know the types of properties to look for and, and how to get the best value. So, um, and it, so it really comes down to that tenant first mentality, um, which really embodies the idea of co-living. So uh, as we grew our portfolio, we knew we wanted every project to be better than the last. We have a... Um, we have like a, a, a register of everything that we learn on, on the previous project. And so it go, yeah, if we do something, we're like, that was a mistake. We write it on the register and then we write what we would do next time um, instead so that we can refer back to it. And now our project manager, um, kind of internal project manager, he, he runs that register for us. Um, and whenever we have meetings with him, I, you know, I see the register when he sends it through every uh, fortnightly report and he's updating it based on the conversation we've had going, um, actually, I wouldn't have done that. I would have done this, or maybe we should try this next time because there was an issue with that particular um, thing that happened. So um, we uh, we do that, and then in terms of that tenant first methodology, um, it's about making sure those decisions make sure we've got a great space for those tenants to live in, not pokey rooms, not um, yeah, we're not going six point five one square meters on the dot. You know, we like to have at least ten point five two for single occupancy. Um, it also has a double be added benefit of meaning I don't have to provide extra lounges so I can be more creative with my our communal space um, so it does make layouts uh, more easy to play with um, and then that we have um, you know a really great design ethos um, which we can talk about a bit later but all around making sure that tenants have a great sense of well-being so we don't like really dark spaces we like light and bright and airy spaces spaces which feel homely comfortable um, because then people are likely to stay for 12 months 24 months how long is tenants must be about three and a half years in an hmo room so um, that's the type of occupancy that we want because it dramatically increases our profitability 
so in, in terms of uh, and again i'll sort of go, go back to square one here so some of the questions i'm going to give you i mean, again i'm just trying to benefit the listener in terms of what they might mm-hmm. you know ask you if they were in my shoes right now so you know yeah. so i'm going to go back to square one with it so if i was let's just say i've done a couple of flips a couple of bites of lets you know i've, I've you know, but I've dipped my toe in the water, so to speak, and I want to start looking at HMOs. Uh, let's just say I, I'm just going to take the example where I'm at a moment. So Brighton and Hove. So I'm in Brighton and Hove. I'm thinking, yeah, HMOs are a very good idea. You know, decent area, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What what fundamentals are you looking for to know that uh, a HMO is going to work in a particular area? Um, the area itself, uh, it comes down to where a lot of people are. Say, what is my tenant demographic? Who am I renting these rooms to? So understanding that first and foremost. Say, um, if you're in Brighton and Hove, you'd be thinking, right, who am I likely to be, to be renting to? Is it, uh, are they social housing tenants? Are they students? Are they uh, yeah, young professionals? Are they visiting contractors? Are they postgraduates? You know, what's the type of tenant that's going to be living there? Um, so we'd be looking for where are the universities, where are those major employers, um, who are they? You know, um, and um, so Brighton, for example, massively young population as um, as well, um, that needs space. You know, demand in Brighton is never an issue. Buying houses is the issue in Brighton. Um, <laughs> you know, so um, at, at a decent price. You know, it's, a, it's you know, down the road from here. So it's something which you know we know we know all too well. Um, so it's the culmination of it's just a combination of three things actually but if we go back to the what i talked about in the book it's having um the that, that population so a town or a city that's got a decent number of people so i use kind of 100,000 as a starting point but yeah it's 80 90 100 it's it's very similar um but if you've got 80,000 people over the age of 60 that's very different to you know 80,000 people on you know between the ages of 20 21 and 35 so um where, where i am in worthing on the south coast the population is slightly slightly differently skewed so in brighton where you know you've got younger population there um, um so population would be number one number two would be employment as we talked about three major employers from three different industry sectors and then finally we'd be looking at the amenities as well so how are they going to enjoy their lifestyle there is there a corner shop is there you know decent access to supermarkets and the communication links to get get around um so those are the key things and train stations are great take a, a, um, a town like birmingham just follow the train stations out there's loads of them um so yeah uh, definitely i, I must admit, I'll, I'll hold my hands up in uh, uh i didn't realize we were that close geographically uh that's uh, only about 10 miles <laughs> down down the road uh, is indeed our, our offices are actually in brighton so uh, yes it is just around the corner you quite literally i'm looking uh, sorry for that, I just go off on a slight tangent apologies <laughs> audience i mean i'm literally looking at the drive at the moment so we're probably not too far away are we no 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 i'm not i'm not in brighton right now i am um you can probably can hear the seagulls um that they'll, they'll be coming past anytime soon <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know if that was you. I didn't know if that was you or me uh, for for <laughs> interruption. So, hey ho, it is what it is. Brilliant. So, so they're the fundamentals that people would would need to be looking at. So, uh, again, in my mind, that that's going to cover quite a few places. I mean, I'm just going to throw random cities out there. You know, Manchester suburbs, Liverpool suburbs, Birmingham suburbs. You know, X, Y, and Z. So, if we've established a place a generic place in which to look for property mm-hmm. and do you have a particular criteria of property that you are looking for when you are looking at the you know your tenant first approach the m the m project what sort of properties would you be looking for once you've established an area so um as we I'll go back to what i was saying a moment ago um it's about the amount of space so the best types of properties that work the, the, the most are the larger kind of Georgian Edwardian style terraced houses um, and, well, and Victorian, I suppose, but that those work the best. Um, and, you know, a terraced house um, can vary dramatically in size. So we have terraced houses in Burnley that are you know, very, very pokey. Um, so are really nice family homes, 
for small family or, or couples. Um, but when we go to a, a terraced house in Portsmouth, where we've got projects, they're yeah, they're like um, they're like a TARDIS. They're absolutely huge. So we can get seven, eight bedrooms out of those. So um, it is very different depending on where you are in the country. But the general makeup of the, that terrace house shape and layout does um, does lend itself very nicely for uh, an HMO of between five to probably eight bedrooms, maybe nine. I, ha I have seen a nine before um, uh, in a massive, massive uh, like the same version of the same layout essentially um, um so th that's what we'd be looking for if we were going for larger style projects and we start to look more at commercial buildings perfect so in terms of so in, in terms of property that they're, they're the they're the key ones if i mean to be fair most places are going to have terrace style victorian style Actually, homes i would imagine yeah, and, and actually, just to add to that, there's also types of properties to avoid. Um, types of properties to avoid are those smaller 1960s houses with a really tiny box room. Mm -hmm. um, and we would generally avoid those. I know a lot of people before mandatory licensing came in used to rent those out as five bed HMOs. Um, you'd have uh, three bedrooms on the first floor where one of them was under six and a half square meters. Then you would have the, the reception room and the lounge downstairs as two bedrooms, you'd have five bedrooms, and then you'd have a small kitchen sticking off the, uh, sticking off the back. Um, and that was quite a, a, a rinse and repeat model that a lot of people did. The mandatory licensing came in, and then they suddenly couldn't rent that box room anymore. So they became four beds. Um, so um, I think that type of house doesn't really work. I like houses where I can go into the loft as well. So they've got a really decent pitch up in the loft mm -hmm. um, and houses with lots of space out the back. So then we've got a few houses where we've still got potential to develop them, go out further uh, around the back, um, but we haven't done it yet because it doesn't make financial sense to say so, um, houses with potential. I think that is the key thing. Um, and if you're going to do a four bed HMO, then um, I would just look at the numbers because I, I don't like um, that small than HMO because the profit is in the fourth room. Um, so if you have one uh, one voyage, you're then uh, breaking even or losing money, essentially. So that's uh, that's why we prefer five. And then actually our ideal is six and above. So between six and eight is, is a great size of property. You mentioned licensing there and so probably do a whole episode on HMO licensing to be honest if that goes uh, yeah if people would like to listen to a whole episode on property licensing um we we have a podcast called property jam which one of our early episodes we talked all about HMO licensing it was probably one of our dullest episodes ever but it's there for people to listen to links will be in the show notes uh, at, indeed they will episode. yes yes <laughs> so we'll, we'll we'll get that by um okay so in that case we won't touch base on that. We'll go go and listen to the episode on property jam. It, but in terms of uh, uh, like licensing Article Four and so forth, uh, there's going to be times where if you're going to do larger HMOs, you might need yeah. to go through planning. Can you just briefly touch upon what the as of the time of recording, roughly what the parameters are? So when would you need to go for planning, and when would you not need to go for planning? Um, yeah, I think just just firstly to clarify for any listener who's not entirely sure, licensing and planning are very different things. They're very divorced from each other. So they're two different legislations with two different remits. Um, they should really have the same remit, but they don't. Um, so licensing is where if you have five or more people in your property, then you need to go for a mandatory license. Some areas will have additional licensing, so you need to go and get um, a license for four people or three people. So some areas in London have got that, others uh, areas have got that as well, like Nottingham, for example. So um, that would mean that, um, yes, th you have to comply with the standards and prove it. Whereas you always have to comply with the standards if you've got an HMO regardless. And remember an HMO ha has multiple occupation, is three or more unrelated people from two or more households. So um, whenever, whenever you have that, you have to comply with HMO legislation, but if you have a license, they just can check. Planning on the other side uh, is different, whereby we have um, uh, different use classes. So we have C3 houses, which are your normal dwelling house, um, like uh, yeah, you probably live in yourself. And you have a C4 um, um, property type under the planning use classes, which then means you can have between three and six unrelated people sharing that particular property. 
And that change of use from C to C3 to C4 um, is permitted development, which means you don't need any planning permission to do it unless your council has an Article 4 directive. And uh, I think you mentioned that a, a moment ago, and that restricts that permission, uh, that change of use from C3 to C4. So we love working in Article 4 areas because we can get planning on those properties because we know how, um, as long as you know what you're working with. When it comes to the seven and eight people, um, which is why, where you were coming from with getting planning on, on, on them, um, they would always require planning permission under what's called sui generis planning, which is Latin, it means in a class of its own. Um, and what we would basically be doing is um, going to the council with a planning application and showing them the, the property that it's big enough, that it's got space for bike storage, for bin storage, for parking, if relevant, for that number of people uh, living in the property. So there can be some quite high, high bars to, to, to pass. Um, but actually, sometimes it's, it's not that difficult to pass them. So um, it is very there, there is no policy from government which um, to sets out how to get to sui generis planning. There's actually no policy in government which tells you how to go from C3 to C4, apart from the PD. So whenever um, Article 4 comes in or you want to go to sui generis, you need to go and look at the local council's planning policies, which can be found in their local plan or in sometimes in a supplementary planning document related to HMOs. Um, if you can't find one, it means that pro they probably don't have one which is an interesting place to be in as well. Um, so a, I would always recommend speaking to a planning consultant um, or a town planner um, who's registered with the RTPI. Um, they're going to be your best bets for understanding that, that local council in particular. Thank you. Uh, that. <laughs> That's... All, all I would say on that is go back to the episode that you just mentioned there on, on Property Jam as well. It's... Uh, it's, it's almost, it can almost, it, it probably sounds like a minefield, but again, you can appreciate if you've got the right professional people around you and you've got a bit of a thirst for knowledge, yeah. there's nothing really to worry about because you're leaning on your professional team. Well, this is, this is why we do what we do um, at the HMO platform. Someone said to me once that, you know, try, you know, trying to get a next level HMO is like trying to shoot an arrow and a bullseye with lots of moving targets in between. You've got your planning, your licensing, your building regs, the and at the tenant, the uh, yeah, all of those bits and bobs. Your finance, um, and you've got to miss all the the, the tar miss all the obstacles and hit the target. Um, and so you know, that's why HMOs are tricky, but that's why they're also highly rewarding when you get them right. So. Um, yeah, so what we did at HMO Platform is designed to help people navigate those obstacles and make sure they're getting it right. Uh, moving on to uh, a couple of things to, to sort of touch base on. So number one is council tax. Number two uh, is, is current bill situation. Um, yep. uh, being part of the Humber Land Association, people that have got you know, HMOs at the moment, you know, a lot of panic around if they're responsible for the bills, electric price up, gas price up, et cetera, et cetera. How, how have you been able to mitigate that in your business? Mitigate um, bills. Um, so unfortunately, when the bills go up, the rent goes up. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. So, um, so all of our tenants who are outside of their six month initial period um, will be getting a rent um a notice of rent increase uh, a very a relatively small notice of rent increase so that it doesn't put people off and people want to move but what we're finding is that it's starting to happen across um the uh, across hmos because um it's yeah tenants I, i'm sure probably are expecting it if i they, they all watch the news they all know that energy bills are going up they've got an all-inclusive um you know house uh, you know they're, they're going to expect energy bills to rise which means we're going to expect those all-inclusive rents to rise so if you put it up 10 pounds a month 20 pounds a month most tenants are not going to complain about that um and try and move out especially at the moment because in, in all the areas that we're investing in there's very few rooms on the market so um it's you know, they'd struggle to find good quality accommodation um if they were to move so um it's not like we're, we're trying to um you know, yeah, because you, you might think oh, we're not giving them much much choice, but 
fair, you know, we don't have much choice in the fact that the energy providers are putting these bills up on us. Um, and, you know, it's either that or we can't pay the mortgage. You know, it's, it's, it's those types of decisions you have to make. It's like, well, let's make a small increase and kind of work with the, the, the tenants. Um, and then when, when the new tenants come in, yes, they are advertised at a slightly higher rate. Yeah, the answer that I was expecting, so that's absolutely fine. And then on to council tax, um, again, a little while ago, I think this varied on area to area. Uh, there was some talks around where, you know, if you've got a, a, an all-inclusive, you know, ensuite room, your local council might charge you council tax per room rather than the dwelling itself. Have you had any of that? Have you or anyone on the HMO platform had any of those challenges? And if so, how have you managed to work through that challenge? Funny, um, funny timing to ask, actually, because there's lots of um, work going on behind the scenes um, about this. So, yes, we have been caught um, by this. We, one of our smallest HMOs, which is a five bed and um, is it was a three bed terraced house converted to a five bed, um, was caught under this and was rebranded as five individual apartments back in 2017. Um, we fought it twice, lost twice, gone to appeal twice, lost to appeal twice. Um, and it's happening more and more that the valuation office agency have taken a stance on the matter. So the only way to change this now, and it, actually, you know what? It doesn't matter whether you've got an ensuite or not. It's any room. It's just that there's only they're starting to pick it up based on where there's a notifiable event. So things like planning permissions or um, the reason why we were picked up is because I forgot to put the council tax in our name. So well, the first time that um, the council tax found out about it was when um, they were speaking to the HMO officer. Um, it was a small council. They chatted to each other and they found out that it was going that we'd bought it. And so I had a call from the council tax department saying, uh, well, we've, we've had noticed that you bought this property. Um, yeah, is that is that right? I said, oh, yes. No, I'm sorry. I forgot to do it in the midst of everything else. Um, and then they said, what are you doing with it? I said, oh, I'm turning it into a five bedroom HMO. Can you send us the floor plans? Yeah, no problem. Um, then about three or four weeks later, I got five bills for council tax. I thought I was doing everything right by being open and honest. Mm, yeah, uh, ev evidently, yeah. <laughs> evidently not. Evident, evidently not. So yeah, an absolute rigmarole with that, um, which I won't go into in detail. Um, but um, yeah, basically what we had to do was lower the rents and then the tenants now pay the council tax in that particular property. And the, the reason to do that is because they get their single lock, single person occupation occupancy discount. So it's cheaper for them to, to pay for it, than, uh, but they wouldn't let us pay for it anyway. So, um, and the way that we're dealing with it right now is because I've just um, had another go at appealing it with a barrister, um, as part of a campaign with a number of other landlords that we're trying, we're, we're basically running a series of um, uh, appeals and um, you know, looking at high court um, as well to try and to get certain things overturned. And also now we're starting to lobby government to change the law. Um, so it's quite, we don't know what's going to happen, but we, we are working with some good people who are putting us in front of, um, yeah, say for example, that, that Michael Gove is aware as are other people of, in, in local MPs. So actually, if anyone is listening to this who has been affected by this or is worried about this, please do send your local MP a letter uh, and please do contact me and I can send you a template, um, which will help because uh, the more MPs that we can get behind it, the more likely the law is to change. Um, and it's very simple for them to change the law and just to make sure that um, the way that the Valuation Office Agency look at it uh, means that they um, they actually take into account what it means to be self-contained because at the moment they don't actually need to look at the self-containment of the unit um, um, so actually that's that's why every single room in an HMO can be banded in its own light until we change the law so it has to it has to go through the government because the VOA have chosen the stance and will continue to rebound sorry to be all doom and gloom but that's that that's where we're at this particular moment in time i don't know when the episode's going out but um at the time of recording that's where we're at we're hoping for some changes soon no no matt i appreciate that and it's you know it's just about giving that you know realism as well so you know again appreciate your openness and honesty uh what i was going to say is that, again your contact details etc on the show notes so if that's something that you have been yep. affected by you know do contact matt and you know, he'll be able to help you out as well. Might be prudent actually a bit further on down the line uh, as and when things change 
uh, might be worth doing uh, a quick episode uh, as an, by way of an update if that's something that you'd be happy to do. Yeah, for sure, definitely. Going back to uh, the trail of thought then. So we found an area, we've found some properties, you know, gone through financing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You mentioned at the start that you have learned a lot from, from each project. Uh, what would your, uh, and again, I'm trying to get in the mindset of someone that might be converting for the first time. Um, what, what key learnings have you had from the developments that you've done so far? Okay, so the, the, I think one of them is um, never underestimate the amount of storage that people need. Um, and we like to build in storage now. So um, we build in wardrobes uh, wherever we can. It also reduces on, on um, kind of the cost and ongoing cost of, the, uh, you know, of some of these things and better for the environment as well from a sustainability perspective. So storage. Also, if you're doing all, all on suite properties, which despite what I've just said about um, banding um, is still the best thing for the market, please don't stop doing it um, because, of, because of what um, I've, I've said, because we are still doing it. Um, um, we, we do it with a bit of risk mitigation, but we are still doing it. Um, if you're doing all on suite rooms, um, have a separate toilet. Yeah, that's something which I think a lot of people forget. You, know, you have guests coming into an HMO, uh, people that live on the third floor of an HMO might want to not go up to their room to go to the, go to the toilet, they can go downstairs. So a separate WC, I think is, is important. And an outside space as well, making sure there's a decent uh, outside space and don't leave it to the last minute to decide what to do with it. You know, have it as part of your development plan to do something cool with the outside space. Um, especially we've been through a pandemic, people that have got outside space, HMOs that are outside space are much happier um, and had a much better time than those that didn't. So um, just bearing, bearing that in mind. Um, other things, yeah, just making sure we don't provide pokey rooms, that there is a, a great amount of space um, that is design led and that we provide a great level of service. In fact, that, that's you know, coming back to, to the book, one of my main threads is that we were in the top 5% of HMOs in an area, so top 5% in space design and service. Um, and if we do that, then we've got a great future-proof product um, and home for people to live in. in. In terms of internal living accommodation, some people will, you know, convert a house into, you know, five bedrooms, but then not have a living area and might have a kitchen that just meets the, uh, you know, minimum spatial requirements. Some people might cordon off uh, and have that extra living room what's your experience been in that does that depend on the tenant profile or is it just good practice to have that extra internal living space if it will create that welcoming environment and tenants might stay longer what's your opinion on that opinion on a separate lounge yeah would you say that should be taken into consideration yeah. um yeah I, th I, th I think so um so most of our properties are combined living spaces so um, where we have one very large space which is designed to um, enable people to cook to be able to sit and eat and to be able to sit and watch tv and, and um, so and, and what we would do is have a clever um, uh, you know we, we would arrange that space in a way where we have dividing walls or uh, you know features which make the spaces you, you kind of you know, separated in a way um because again that gives us flexibility with um, with spaces because you might have a space which um it could it can be a bedroom instead so if you have if you can work make, make it a bedroom instead a decent bedroom then we would try and make the communal space all of one however a lot of properties have some awkward spaces um, like a room which is maybe not big enough to be a bedroom which is in a space which is not near the communal area so uh, when you have those types of spaces then again being creative um creating a snug or a cinema room um basements are great for for like those cinema room environments um that or um or what one of our clients has just done and she's got this um, huge property um and a room which is uh, it's just, it's a single room it's big enough to be a single bedroom but we don't want to let a single bedroom we want to uh, all the other rooms are like 15 to 22 square meters each it's ridiculous um plus an ensuite so this particular room which is about 10 square meters is going to be um co-working so i'm going to put a, a bench in it a bit of a kitchenette and um there's room for four people to work side by side 
uh, on desk so you kit it out with with uh, in like a mini you know cool um office space um so that uh, you know there's many many places where they can um sit so in fact in this particular property she's going to have um a lounge she's going to have a kitchen diner a like massive kitchen diner you've got this co-working space and also um actually no that's it because we've got this the, the sitting area the lounge lounge diner no, sorry kitchen diner and then uh the co-working space she's also got um, working space in the kitchen and each of the rooms has got a desk working space built in um as well as an ensuite um so that is your ideal really and in terms of in terms of that sort of design and, and that thing again would you be doing that for every single tenant profile that you have i mean if you had a bunch of blue collar workers yeah. for example would you probably go down that route would you not would you do things differently yeah so if your profile is slightly different you might um well i don't think different different um profiles um need to be singled out that that effect yeah, yeah, that differently but uh, it might mean the difference of well can i you know maybe you can get past licensing by turning that space into a bedroom therefore maybe i will um, as opposed to licensing will allow it but actually i think my tenant profile would prefer that that was a co-working space and because of that i could put my rent up by 20 pounds a month so um i claw back that rent and there's there's a interesting argument to say well you know, six compromised bedrooms um, actually makes less money than five epic bedrooms. So five epic, yeah, it's the same, like six epic bedrooms is probably better than seven compromised bedrooms. Mm. So um, that's the approach that we would take. Um, and we see it time and time again, you know, when people, we look at people's schemes and they go, yeah, we're gonna get, we're gonna get six bedrooms out of this. And we go, well, yeah, you can get six bedrooms out of it, but I think you'll make more money if you do five. I can imagine that if for people that might not have done that first, that could be quite a difficult concept to grasp. But once you've done it a few times, you can see proof in the pudding. Of course, yeah. I, you know, I'm sitting in, I know that makes sense. But if you're doing it for yeah. the first time, people might question you and go, well, why? But of course, everything you've just said kind of gives you the reason why that is the case. Well, it, well to, su to summarise, if you've got um, five bedrooms, um, so six bedrooms, uh, two of which you've you've compromised because um, you wanted to get that sixth bedroom. So you've got two single rooms and maybe four double rooms. Those two single rooms are probably going to be empty, maybe let's say 30% of the time as because they're less desirable to let. Therefore, if you look at your actual turnover over a 12 month period, it's probably going to be less than if you had five rooms let all the time. That's That's essentially it. And also you've got fewer people uh, less um, intensity in the house, less electricity, less gas, less water being used. Um, it's, these things are not not massive changes, but yeah, we're talking you know, even like a three to four to five percent difference will have a big impact on your bottom line. Completely agree. Uh, I think from just trying to think question wise, that probably would guide people through everything that they probably need to know um it, i guess uh, polishing it off at the end though would be uh lettings agencies so mo most people are going to be familiar with dealing with your bread and butter buy to let you, you mm -hmm. know re family rentals in terms of uh, hmo lettings would you advise people if they enjoy management look to set up their own management company and deal with that that way or should they you know leverage their time and look to find uh, an agency that specializes in HMO lettings? Well, that I think is a, it depends question. Um, and it depends on the person. Um, but I think what you just said there at the end is really important. If you're gonna get an agent, they must be specialist HMO um, agents. Um, do not just use your high street buyer to that agency because, um, because, because they, they don't really get it and they will, yeah, the service will not be as good. Um, as if you have a specialist who specialises in HMOs because they they really understand it. So the question is, should you set up on your own? If you if you've got so my story, um, I had two HMOs. I managed them myself. I was like, and as soon as I had two, I was like, I can't do this anymore. And my, my skill set is not in managing tenants. So I decided that we were going to get a local agent. So I did some research, found a good good one. It was good for a short period of time. 
then wasn't so good um, because a member of staff left. I followed that member of staff when they set up on their own. And then I've had a really good experience since with that particular agent in that particular area. But across the, because we invest across the UK, we've got you know, about six, seven different areas that we're invested in. The quality of HMO agents is, is it really varies. Um, to, and most of them are really poor. And um, they, a lot of them have their own portfolio, but they've built it up over a period of time. So they understand the market, um, but they might have 100 rooms which they own and maybe 20 rooms that they don't. You know, which rooms are they incentivized to fill first? You know, there's a bit of a disincentive for, for, um, um, for, for you. So um, we were a bit frustrated that our tenants were getting different experiences across the country. So that's when we decided to, set, to take our lettings in-house. And actually, and in, we've kind of done that, but also set up a, um, a UK-wide management agency at the same time, which can manage um, HMOs um, in a, basically in a co-living way um, anywhere in the country. Um, but we're growing in the Midlands and on the South Coast. So we are um, adding properties to the portfolio in those areas. Um, for management um, but I'd say if someone is contemplating setting up their own to manage their own um, you've got to love it um, because it is a hard job um, I do not manage the properties I have we have a team of people that manage the properties and um, yeah if you're growing a port it's, it's really hard to manage a portfolio whilst you're trying to grow a portfolio so what I'd suggest is grow your portfolio to the size you're happy with. And then if you are if you want to take on the management, then employ somebody yourself to do it in-house and then you'll have economy of scale to be able to afford them. And I'm just trying to wrap my head around if you're sort of based on the South Coast and you've got uh, properties, let's just say in, in Birmingham, but you're managing them, you're managing them all. Uh, does that involve Scotland. people being on the ground? In stuff in Scotland. <laughs> Okay, well, I'd argue, okay, well, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's say Scotland then. Um, so you're down on the South Coast, you've got stuff in Scotland. Yeah. Does that involve having runners on the ground in, in Scotland if you're managing or because of, you know, technology, Skype, Zoom, WhatsApp, et cetera, you, you're able to effectively manage it properly from the South Coast? How, how do you approach that? Well, without giving away our trade secrets, um, we, <laughs> um, yeah, technology is a big part of it. Um, so you, we, we can do a lot um, without leaving the South Coast, um, but there's always going to be an element of on the ground. So um, our long term goal, growth goals with with Cohome um, is to have regional managers that are um, on the ground. Um, so at the moment we have that in the Midlands and the South Coast where they're looking after the people. Um, and then we have essentially a bit of a kind of a headquarters that can be based anywhere, which can do um, viewings and maintenance. Fantastic stuff. Uh, if they, um, I say, I'll get my words out correctly. Uh, Matt and Anna, you mentioned it a couple of times, so we'll sort of quickly dive into next level landlord. I'll just give people a brief synopsis. And again, links will be in the show notes, find it on Amazon, etc. Yeah. Give people a brief uh, synopsis, if that's the right word. Synopsis. Uh, tell people yeah. synopsis. It's one of those days. Tell people about the book and um, yeah, please. Yeah, so um, yeah, Next Level Landlord is um, a book about the property investing and development, which focuses on HMOs and co-living. Um, and a lot of the things I've talked about today um, about creating properties which are in the top 5% of your marketplace um, it, it, it is the theme. So we're talking about top 5% of space, design and service. Um, and then I should, should talk about how we do that. And there are some methodologies within it um, all within our tenant first methodology, um, which is about how, uh, you know, next level landlords, you know, that, that aspiration to be that landlord, which has got, uh, which has a great customers in their properties that has, uh, you know, it just turns over a profit. You know, it, it has those five elements that we talk about, focus, insight, review and deliver, um, service and thrive, which are the five elements of the tenant first method. Um, so I go into detail around all around that. And then it's peppered with stories of, um, uh, like for example my when i was first managing um uh, that first hmo uh, um within my first month there was a fight broke out police involved tenants moving out and all of that and so I, you know, it starts with that and there's um talking about analyzing deals raising finance um how we do it without our own money um and uh, how to build a portfolio which is which is very future proof and how to scale it so essentially it's it's a it's a bit of a, a 
if someone hasn't invested in property before and wants to look at HMOs, it's a great book to get you um, up to speed on where I think you should be in the market. Brilliant stuff. And again, link, links in the show notes to that. So thank you for saying it. it's always, you know, I love talking to people when you get the, the, the sort of the passion and the drive that you have to share information as much as you can with, with others. You know, these podcasts are always, you know, refreshing from, from that point of view. Uh, Matt, I just want to say a massive thank you for your time. It's been really insightful. Uh, hopefully people will take away a lot from this. Uh, if people want to find out more uh, about you, where can they go? Well, you can find me on social media. Um, and my handle is at clearly Matt Baker. Um, and also, if you want to find out more about what we do, um, you can head over to thehmoplatform.co.uk. Any other words of wisdom? Well, you mean any, it's a full stop. Um, I, I, I think um, coming back to what I started, said at the beginning, um, so for your audience, for people who are thinking about getting into HMOs, um, do something simple to start with. Don't try and um, do something massively complicated. Um, and so that you're learning only a few things at a time. Um, and if you want to go um, big, then it gets easier um, from that point on. Um, so yeah, start simple and grow um you know one project at a time and that's a fantastic place to wrap up matt thank you very much for your time not a problem thank you for having me